in order to look at uh, all the potential offer communication, I like to take you back in uh, 1918 or so. After Einstein had uh, dumped his general relativity on the world, uh, Lyle attempted to unify gravity and electromagnetism by relaxing the invariance of the <coughs> inner product of the vector, just as Einstein had relaxed the invariance of the outer product. But Einstein shot him down, and uh, uh, Einstein and others looked at five dimensional ways of including electromagnetism and unifying it with gravitational waves. And in all of those approaches, they assumed that there was no physical reality in the fifth dimension. And in doing so, they zeroed out certain quantities in the equation that they arrived at. What I'd like to guide you through this afternoon is let's combine both of those approaches and let's let the potential of the fifth dimension having a physical reality. We don't specify what it is, we'll find out. What Lyle did was he used the length of a vector and a scale factor based upon the gauge potentials. And by the way, his work is worth the gauge potential, the word gauge potential came from. And from that he showed that you can derive Maxwell's equations. And here is the, the field components of the electromagnetic field that comes from that scale factor. Okay, <coughs> here's the way he ended up with Maxwell's equation, that is, he used the, the Bianchi identity to get two of them, and he used the four vector curve to get two more, and he had conservation charge. Now let's do it in five dimensions. When you do it in five dimensions, you end up with five gauge potentials instead of four. You go through the same rigor and roll, and now you got a ten component uh, vector field instead of the six component. You can do the same thing. Uh, okay. <coughs> and what I want to do now, though, is uh, look at what the conservation of charge, conservation of fifth dimension, does to this five dimensional manifold. Anytime you put a restriction on one dimension uh, or on one manifold, you can embed a hypersurface in there. So we use the IJ uh, indices to indicate space, the five dimensional space uh, quantities, and the alpha and beta to limit it to the four dimensional surface quantities. So you then get the surface of the uh, field tensors in terms of the, the space field tensors. And you can write the space energy momentum tensor for matter. And you can write the surface, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, the space matter uh, in terms of the surface metric, or <coughs> vice versa. And then if you consider the conservation of the fifth dimension, and notice the conservation is written in the same note, Mathematical sense is conservation of mass density. Then you can write that surface energy momentum tensor in such a form that when you look at it, you can see Einstein's field equations. Okay. And when you take the, uh, uh, those equations to be Einstein's field equations, you find out the only thing that the fifth dimension can be is mass density. <laughs> what I tell you then is there's two ways of describing phenomena that we see in Einstein's general theory of relativity. One is from the surface, the four dimensional curved surface that Einstein gave us in 1916, and the other is from the five dimensional space uh, <coughs> manifold of space, time, and mass. That, that surface is embedded into the conservation of mass. Now we talk about a similar situation 
the way you're traveling on the surface of the Earth, which is a curved two-dimensional surface embedded in a three-dimensional space by the fact it's on a sphere. And the, the, the difference is, if you're using a navigational system on the surface of the Earth, like the old Navy used to use a little random <coughs> system, uh, that's only a two-dimensional navigational system compared to a GPS system which is three-dimensional. Now not only can you get your two-dimensional spaces, you can use elevation as well. So if we use a five-dimensional thing, we should be able to find phenomena that you cannot describe within Einstein's hypersurface. So <coughs> let's look down at what some of the things that occur because of this. One, if you're going to have gauge fields that tie gravitational and electromagnetic phenomena together, there must be an inductive coupling. This is, we all know, you can't have an electric wave without a magnetic component associated with it. If they're tied together in such a fashion, you can't have electromagnetic phenomena without having gravitational phenomena. Therefore, there must be some coupling constant. And when you look at it theoretically, you find that the charge to mass ratio that forms the natural coupling constant between the gravitation and the uh, electromagnetic stuff is the square root of dielectric constant and the gravitational constant itself. Now, there are, there are some experiments that have already measured this, uh, but those are owned by Norseth Grumman, not myself. So when you go to the five dimensions and you, you derive the field equations, you find that instead of having the five Maxwell's equations, you end up with eight. And we've heard, we've seen at least a couple of presentations of gravitational wave equations. We can do that too. <laughs> but things get tied up here. You can see that it, just as the old electromagnetic wave, you, you can't have one without the other. Now we find that the gravitational vector field and the gravitational scalar field gets wrapped together with the electromagnetic component. So if you spend a lot of time passing through the solutions of this, you'll end up with something like this. You end up with two types of solutions to these wave equations. One transverse wave. Now, in addition to having the, the well-known electric and magnetic components that operate 90 degrees from each other, and both of them are transverse to the direction of propagation, there's also a gravitational component that's transverse to the propagation. And you say, well, we've never seen that before. Not totally true. The Nichols and Hall experiment showed such an effect, but it was within the uh, experimental error of their device, and therefore they wouldn't have seen this. Uh, even the, with the technology available to Los Alamos, in the early 1980s, we did not have sufficient accuracy to effectively measure that gravitational but the other thing is, you have another system of waves. I call them non-transverse for the following reason. Two of the components are longitudinal. But I can't just say that it's a longitudinal wave because associated with those two components is a gravitational scalar. And a scalar is not a vector, so it's neither transverse nor longitudinal. So I refer to these waves as non-transverse waves. So, just to further complicate the thing, we no longer have a simple initial relation. We get three of those suckers, and it depends upon how your propagation medium varies the density as well as the number of other things. Okay. Oh. How do I get out of that sucker? Just click the mouse anywhere else. There you go. So, where are we going to do all of the communication concept? Well, the transfers, well, let me give you a, a little story. When Ben Rich was designing and building the stealth fighter, 
He contracted me to design him some stealth antennas. And the reason is that everybody was measuring transverse weather. On the Navy ship, we had ACM equipment to measure everything. But what if you could communicate that it wasn't electromagnetic or not? It wasn't not. I didn't start again. What if you could communicate with signals that were not transverse electromagnetic signals? That is, these others. So I tried in vain to design antennas for the non transverse. And I failed. Some years later, I discovered my error. I was designing antennas the way we were taught in electromagnetic classes to design antennas. That is, <coughs> you have a, a sending antenna, you wiggle an electron, and it makes a field for it. The receiving antenna is a response of an electron to a signal. But now, if you talk about a transverse electric component, you can't wiggle the particle because it's already traveling at the speed of light. So what my error was, was I was trying to design a particle field antenna when I should have been thinking about a field field antenna. Because only fields can follow fields without inertia. So <clears throat> how are we going to do that? What is a field field antenna? Well, one of the things we all did in electromagnetic classes is you shine a light into a piece of glass you calculate the transmission and reflection coefficients. You do it at an angle, and you find that the polarization and the magnetization and all that come into play when you try to account for the boundary conditions at a boundary between two media. Well, you got to do that in five dimensions here. So you, you've got gravitational polarization, susceptibility, and induction. So here's what the system might look like. You have a medium which has a, a different index of reflection than what we currently do. Uh, while I was still at New Mexico Tech, I had one of my material students make me 27 different types of glasses with different indexes of refraction. <coughs> I had a, a doctoral student do a bunch of calculations. Now, you can imagine these calculations that we're, we're talking about not having any generators for these non-transverse waves, except this kind of generator. So you gotta make a generator before you can make a receiver, and then have sufficient energy going into your generator to have enough energy coming out to tell whether or not you've got anything. So what we needed was indexes of refraction in our stuff so that we could have at least uh, something that we can measure with today's technology. Because the only thing we have is we can make transverse waves all over the place. All right, all of us carry marvels of transverse waves. I never thought that they could have a utility out of it like this. So we can make and receive transverse waves all the time. So we make, start out with a transverse wave and we hit a angular, uh, or if we hit a boundary between two media at an angle. And we polarize this transverse wave at a certain way so that in the media there are two waves. In order to satisfy the boundary <coughs> condition, you now have a little bit of the energy in a non-transverse wave. So that when you come out of that back into the air, you now have two waves. A transverse wave and all of it with an index of refraction that I know of, that carries the majority of the energy. But you have a small non-transverse wave. And you can put whatever you want in front of the, the transverse to stop it, you know, a piece of lead, a dirt, whatever. You got the non-transverse still going. And so here we now have as a receiving antenna. Here comes that transverse or non-transverse wave, and it strikes a different. Uh, boundary. Again, in the media, you, you generate uh, non transverse and transverse waves so that when you come out of that, you, you have two waves. Part of the energy is in the non transverse, some is in the transverse. And in this case, most of the energy 
is in the non-transverse, and that's lost. But you trap the, the transverse wave in here, yourself, phone, or whatever, and, uh, and measure. The calculations that I was able to get on my student was, with the indexes of refraction my other student had made, was that we lost a 10 to the 7 in <laughs> energy going in, what came out. But that's doable with a lot of today's uh, technologies and lasers available to us. So, there you go. We have 15 minutes available for questions. <laughs> yes? Uh, pointing vector, I seem to recall reading that any component of uh, a traveling wave that was not transverse has an identically zero pointing vector, which means that it cannot transfer energy at all from A to B. So how do you propose to communicate with such a wave? If you look at the five-dimensional pointing vector, you find that it's not zero. Aha. There are some interesting properties that will show up when you do that, though, that may or may not be good to break up, bring up here. One of them is... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the energy density... It's a perfect place, isn't it? That's why you always bring it up. <laughs> the energy density and the uh, optical pressure are not one and one in five dimensions. In four dimensions, they're identical because they're the sum of the squares of the field component. But in five dimensions, the energy density is the sum of the squares of all the components, including the scalar. But the pressure is the sum of the squares of the electric and magnetic and the scalar gravitational component minus the square of the gravitational vector component. Ah, so you ask me what frequency at which the, the pressure is zero. It's non-zero frequency. Is it? Yeah. Would this interfere with conventional communications at all? There, I can find, the only place I can find non-transverse, talking to transverse waves is at the boundary of medium. Mm. And the two solutions are independent, except in the boundary. But uh, back to that zero pressure, it's curious that it's around three degrees Kelvin. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker.